Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond Entertainment from Panasonic Avionics. I'm here with Blake Emery from Blake Emery Associates, and we're here to talk about research today. Blake, welcome Sounds to the show. Great. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. It's a uh, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, you know, we've known each other for some time. I wonder if you could maybe just talk about your history, and then uh, let's get on to the, the research element. Sure. Uh, my background is uh, in psychology, uh, but specifically in doing uh, research within the field of psychology. And uh, somehow, at a, a portion of my career, I ended up uh, at the Boeing Company. And after a career in kind of organizational psychology, uh, I kind of branched into what I consider consumer psychology. And in consumer psychology, you really... What I studied in school is the psychology of relationships. Mm -hmm. And that was really relationships between people. Mm -hmm. So when you're in organization development, it's kind of the relationship. A lot of times it's the relationship between teams within an organization to help that organization get better. But then once I branched into consumer psychology, there you're looking at your a person, a human's relationship with an object, mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. car, an airplane seat, an airplane window, bins. I mean, it's like, wow, that's, that's really something. And that got me into, got me back into uh, one of my, you know, first loves, and that is doing research, research and science as a method of gaining knowledge about the world. Research and science as a method of understanding relationships between vari variables, things that vary that you mm -hmm. can measure. And if you can't measure it, the exciting idea of figuring out, well, how can you measure it? If you could measure it, what would you do? So you build a construct like, you know, passenger experience or something like that. And you figure out how you can measure things like that. Yeah, and, and passenger experience is so key to the airlines. It's their customers. The airlines are furiously competing on giving these customers on board, and it's such a constraint, the cabin. You know, I really think the cabin is the constraint. If you look at the technology of today, I mean, between, you know, the major airframers, I mean, you know, they're all getting great wings. I mean, they're all getting great aerodynamics. Some engine company comes out with a new engine on one airframer's product, well, guess what? Before you know it, it shows up on mm. the other, that technology is on the other person's prod, product also. So what does that leave for differentiation? I mean, you need to be able to, in, in the today's competitive world, you need to be able to differentiate. It's all about differentiation. So, and to me, the key point of differentiation is going to be the cabin. The key point of differentiation is, can you create a better experience for the passenger than the competition. And that experience needs to get better to the extent that someone prefers your product. That's the goal of differentiation is preference for your, your product, even enough preference so that they would chase your product, mm. pay a premium for your product, et cetera. And a lot of it these days, I mean, it's all about brand. And so you can say, well, you know, you know, I wear, you know, these kind of shoes or I, I flew this air, airline and, you know, because I'm cool. You know, I mean, nobody actually says that, but there's, there's something going on deep in the brain related to your identity and the brands that you use. Yeah, and it's, it, it's fascinating. The, and I, I actually wonder when it happened, when that period between, you know, the cabins being somewhat standardized. I mean, they were never completely standardized, but you then started getting quite a big differentiation in the business class seats, the suites, the entertainment systems, the food. I, I, you know, I, I wonder when that really came in and then it feels like the airlines have really grappled with this and started to move ahead. And you see, you know, you see some people with this fantastic suite, this great food experience. You see other airlines trying to differentiate on price, on service. Yeah. How has that manifested through your career? Yeah, that's really that's really a great question, and and you know, uh, differentiation on price in a sense is no differentiation at all. You mm -hmm. know, you're just commoditizing your 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 product, and you know, it can end up being a race to the bottom, which doesn't help anybody. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that because in in a lot of ways in my career, I 
by choice, didn't really focus on the premium cabin, the premium class experience. Because when I flew, in, you know, all over the world, I flew in premium class. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's 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 a pretty fine experience, almost no matter what airline you're on. So my passion was for the the economy class passenger, okay? Mm-hmm. Because for me, to, to my way of thinking, the economy class passenger basically has been overlooked. In fact, anytime I or someone on my team or together, anytime we created a change in the cabin that created more space or a change in the seat design, because I've designed a couple of seats too, but every time that you come up with a, a design that creates more space for the passenger, which would be a good thing, pretty much invariably our customer, the airlines, bless their hearts, would fill that space with more seats and densify more. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not criticizing them for that because if we ran an airline, we'd be doing the, same, the same thing. thing we yeah. understand. We completely understand that position. But meanwhile the passenger experience suffers. Mm-hmm. So that's why in my career, I, I really began to focus on, you know, I mean, I got told by engineers I was working with time and time again, sorry, buddy, you ain't getting any more space. This is what you got to work with. So that caused me to turn to neuroscience and the brain in my research to look at how we could enhance the perception of space, even if you're not necessarily getting any more space. So that it had a big that had a big influence on my career and the way I do things to this day. It's, it's fascinating, and you, you really see it manifest in you know. I'm well aware of some of the cabins that you had, just that key, uh, that, that key design element in. Um, you know, you, you talked about space in a way. Um, that I think we've all seen very, you know, very real over the last, you know, couple of decades where airplanes have gone from quite a constrained space to having that, that openness. We've also seen elements of color. I, w- I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you take, you know, the research that you've done and then how does that then finally manifest into a design and into a new cabin? It's, it's a fascinating process. And I have to admit, at times, it's a frustrating process. Mm-hmm. The, the, the point where it gets frustrating is when you've done enough research to know you've got something that's going to improve the passenger experience, and then you've got people who are actually, you know, building the airplane that says, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that can be a frustrating point. But let me, but let me go f- further back than that and, and, and see when, when, when does it start? And it actually has to start with the very kernel of a theory, mm-hmm. okay? A theory being something that, that, that uh, is, is a kind of a bridge that explains the relationship, that explains uh, what, what we'll call natural phenomenon. And the behavior and what you experience inside the cabin can be considered, you know, a natural phenomenon in that you can observe people's behavior and you can, you can measure how people are thinking about it and feeling about it if you're careful about it. So it starts with the kernel of a theory. You've got to have an idea, just some kind of a little idea about, well, if we could do this, if we could shape bins and sidewalls this way— Maybe that would, maybe that would would be better. Now, mm-hmm. now a lot of times, you've got to do some kind of qualitative research to even get that that kernel of an idea, so that you begin to have a a theory. And uh, I was involved in in a lot of been involved in a lot of research with the flying public all over the world to understand how different cultures expressed and experienced things and what they what they wanted on on a kind of on a deep psychological level to get you know from 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 my way of thinking to get the kernel of a theory to begin with uh, 
Uh, you you need to get deeper in the brain. You you just can't go out and ask the man on the street. You just can't go out and do a survey and ask him a direct question and think you're going to get something. You got to find ways to get deeper in the brain than that. But once you've got that information, then you've got a kernel of a theory. So with the theory fr from the kernel of a theory, you can generate a hypothesis or multiple hypotheses. Now, these hypotheses have to be rigorously tested if you're using what I call the scientific attitude. Those hypotheses have to be rigorously tested uh -huh. and able to be replicated. And if it turns out that, that uh, the data and the outcome is, is positive, then you're actually building a theory. Theories get built hypotheses get tested. Mm. And then once you have a theory, uh, then you you can test that theory. It, it, it's really great. You know, you have, um, I'm trying to think of an, a quick example I could use that wouldn't be proprietary. Um, let, let's, let's just say you have, uh, you know, someone someone comes up with a design idea that says, oh, on our airplane windows, you know, let's have mullions. Let's, let's have some kind of, you know, design on the windows themselves. But if you have a theory that says anything in the airplane that makes it feel like jail or prison you don't want to do that. <laughs> well, guess what? You have something that looks like bars on the window. I mean, you just, you know, you're, you, you know, that's just not going to work. So yeah, that's an yeah. example of how these kind of things can work. But so it's kernel of a theory to generate hypotheses, hypotheses to test, to build the theory or not build the theory because maybe your hypotheses turn out to be not true and then you're back to ground zero, which happens. Still good information, though. Knowing what not to do, I think, is just as important as what to do. A, a process that's, that's really worked in general for me over the years is you start with some qualitative research to get, let's say, to get a bunch of ideas, okay? Uh -huh. Then then what you got to do is you've got to figure out how to kind of parse those ideas and pick which ones you think are the best. And then you test those ideas using a true experiment, by true experiment, I mean is a situation where you are, you, you've got independent variables and dependent variables. And it's inde an independent variable is independent because it's independent of everything else. You manipulate, you control that variable. The dependent variable depends on what, you, what happens as you manipulate it differently, you know. I mean— uh, we, we can go to a simple example if you want. But so then, so the, the, the reason you do the controlled experiment is to find out if, okay, you've got this idea that uh, this new, we'll say, lavatory layout mm -hmm. is going to improve passenger experience. And so you test it against, okay, here's, here's today's lavatory. You have Put a bunch of people in, you know, in a mock-up where they have to use the lavatory, <laughs> and then, and then I'm making this up as I go, and then, <laughs> and then you have your new layout lavatory, and you put a bunch more people through, you know, big sample size, do your run your statistical tests. Lo and behold, hey, this is this new lab layout is statistically significantly better. Okay, that's data. That's something you can that's take real, yeah. to the bank. Now, in this case, the bank, a lot of times, turns out to be engineers that then have to build that new lavatory. And they say, yeah, great idea, but the plumbing doesn't work and all this stuff. And so that's, that's where some of the frustration can come in. Then, then, then you just have to scramble like crazy to get an idea that you have demonstrated is good, but you still have to work like crazy to get it into revenue service. Yeah, we're definitely seeing this, uh, this impact of... In, uh, what's, the, what's the right word for it? This this impact of high end designs in the cabin these days. We're seeing you know seats that we, we aren't just thinner to add space, but there's something about them that's that's gorgeous looking. They're putting they're putting a lot of focus on color, material, finish. You know, we, with our new system, we we put a huge emphasis on design. You look at the airframes themselves. You know, Boeing have their new newer Sky Air interior, Sky interior, Airbus have their airspace interior. And you can see just so much energy is going in there. 
and it's we, we're really seeing that manifest in aerospace. It kind of feels like we dropped a little bit behind automotive there in some respects, where they've really pushed for these, you know, very integrated, high design feature you know, interiors, and now that seems to be pushing more and more into aerospace as well. Yeah, well, I can I can tell you that in 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 my work, uh, I definitely look to high end automobiles for inspiration. Uh-huh. I mean, that's a, a good designer, um, you know, a good industrial designer. That's um, that's what they do. One of the primary things they do is they look for inspiration in nature or in the world. And I can tell you, I've used high high end concept cars and their interiors as part of inspiration for think for example the 77 flight deck which i worked on the design of that and uh, high-end automobiles were definitely an influence the shape of the 787 dreamliner the exterior shape of the 787 dreamliner highly influenced by the sh- a shark yeah, yeah, yeah. You could you could see that, especially the earlier ones with the yeah the sweeping exactly. tail. That was exactly. so pretty. Yeah, and it, it seems to you, one of the things that we're definitely seeing. You know, we're seeing now. Our customers are telling us about is the impact of even those small design elements: the screens, the bezels, the handsets, the armrests of the seat, quilting versus straight lines. It's it's as if uh, the whole industry has become more and more savvy towards this gorgeous end of design. Now that, that impacts the emotions, the emotions of the passenger. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's 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 a c- c- couple of points here. First of all, those are touch points. You know, literally what what people smell, feel, taste, touch, everything that that that's all that's all a, a huge part of things. And the other thing is. A lot of times what's going on there, and hopefully the designer is, is aware of this at the time they design it, but they could be meeting unarticulated needs. You know, it's like sometimes you'll go in something in, a, in an airplane and you'll find some little little nice touch that, that just you just feel good just looking at it. And, and it's like if you really thought it through, you'd think, well, I like that. And I didn't even know I needed that. I didn't know I liked that, you know, but but there it is. So that's really cool whenever you can scratch that itch and meet an unarticulated need. I, I read a great piece recently about touch in particular, and it was from uh, one, one of the electronics manufacturers for uh, consumer electronics, like uh, laptops and tablets, et cetera. And they were saying in their showrooms, the screens are put at such an angle where a, uh, a customer has to move it to get themselves ergonomically situated. And they say just by creating that touch element creates this connection with the, the equipment that just aids immediately towards sales. That, that is a very, very uh, fascinating point because, because and, and what that's related to, Andy, is control. That is psychologically related to control because one of the ways a person begins to feel control especially in an environment where you don't feel like you're in much control, like an airplane, in order to be able to move something or manipulate something gives you a little modicum of control, and that's a psychological plus for you. So, yeah, no, that's real important. So when we then apply that into our environment, you're, you're right, you're middle seat, you know, economy, just the ability to articulate the screen or the materials on the screen or the armrests, or the connectors, et cetera. Exactly. I think a really good example, um, you know, a lot of times in economy class these days, you'll see seats that are already in their reclined position. You know, on, on one standpoint, you know, you can see where that makes sense to the airline. It might make sense. But if a person can push a button and recline a little bit, even if it's not a lot of recline, they manipulated the system. That gives them a little bit of control. Now, one of the things that always struck um, uh, uh, myself whenever I've worked with you, and I remember the first time we met, is you used to talk about the magic of flight. And I've always remembered that. It stuck with me. It kept me in cabin for most of my career. I wonder if you could end by just talking about the importance of the magic of flight, because 
is this is something that's always been near to my heart. You kind of created this. Well, it was really, uh, it was, it became really, really important to me also because uh, when, when we first uh, began to do research all over the world, uh, one of the things that we discovered was that um, to a person, to a culture, someone's first trip in an airplane and especially takeoff was always described in terms like magic, magical like terms. And, you know, described as just a, a wonderful, transformative, transcendent, magical thing. But then the same people in, in this research, they're writing stories and they talk about their first experience and then their most recent experience. Well, the most recent experience wasn't so magical. <laughs> okay. So, so for me and, 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 and my career, literally, and my, the team I was working with at the time, we made, we made a conscious decision that what we were going to try to do in cabin design is find ways to trigger in the brain that original magical experience. And so that was the motivating factor because, you know, I mean, a lot of times, like in marketing things, they'd say, bring back the magic of flight. Well, technically, that's not it. Technically, the magic is always there. The miracle always happens. The darn heavy plane takes off, you know. <laughs> but, um, but, but to find a way to get the brain to remember that and send those nice chemicals again through your system. That, that, that became the strategy. That became the goal and the strategy. It's great. It's the, uh, the theater, the ceremony. You know, don't just give the food. Have it, it, it presented. It, it, the rituals. The exactly, rituals. the rituals. Uh, you know, every culture has its rituals, has its cere ceremonies. And, and uh, I kind of view being in the air as a culture in and of itself with its own rituals and, and uh, celebrations. And celebration is, again, the right term because, uh, because we need to find ways. And it's, get, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy in, in, a, in an economic system where, oh, you can have all the space you need. You just got to pay for it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough challenge. And that's really, that's really what we want to do is find a way to celebrate that magic. So we talked about research. We talked about, you know, the, the public. Um, why don't we just ask them a direct question? What's, what's, what's the issue with that? Oh, Andy, that's a great question. And uh, the whole art of asking questions, the art and science of asking questions is really, uh, really a deep one. To, um, so j just to answer your direct question right <laughs> now, um, one of the reasons, and, and, and a lot of people don't think about it this way, don't really understand it this way, is that when I am asked a direct question, uh, it's 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 very funny thing, but um, and, and you can you can ex experience the, the the most if the direct question is in some form of why, well, like well, why do you feel that way, or why did you answer it this way. That's a direct question. A direct question poses to the organism a little bit of stress, mm -hmm. okay? Like, oh, man, he just asked me to justify a viewpoint. Or he just asked me a direct question. I need to come up with an answer. So that's a little bit of a stress. Now, the funny thing about that when it comes to questions is the organism through time has developed a lot of great ways to get rid of stress, of that particular kind of stress. And, and, and the main one is to answer the question real quick. Come up with an answer and blurt it out. The reason that's not necessarily good re research is that that answer, because in part it was a stress reduction technique on the part of the person or the participant, may not be the best answer. 
Mm. You need to find ways to get deeper. Now, now the best thing you can do is, is ask basically the same question in an indirect way and in multiple ways. So, for example, you know, in our, um, for example, if you are trying to find out what people like in a laboratory, to use a, a, a silly example we used before, you know, you might ask one way for this to just open ended say, hey, go ahead and design this laboratory any way you want. You know, and a certain thing may come out. And then a second way, you try essentially asking the same question again by pu putting that feature. Maybe there was a there was a sink and a counter that you, you want specific feedback on. Well, you you give them the opportunity to experience that sink and counter. Do not ask a question about the sink and counter but ask a series of questions about how they feel about their experience. And so, and, 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 and if, you know, and so then you're asking the same thing in multiple ways using multiple methods. And if the answers all come out pointing the same direction, then you've got a powerful response. So you were talking about the importance of language. So rather than, you know, did you enjoy the Ferrari? The answer is yes, but... How did the Ferrari make you feel? Exactly. See, that's a, the perfect example of the difference between an open-ended closed, open-ended question and a closed question. And, you know, did you like the Ferrari? Yes or no? That's the that's the ideal closed question because the person they they just get two responses. Sometimes people can feel kind of squeezed in mm -hmm. if their responses are limited. But you know, how did that Ferrari make you feel? That's that's a that's a different thing. You still you still may get um, you, you still will want to ask other questions besides that, and at least that's a very open ended question that gives them that gives them an opportunity. It, it's really funny. One one of the ways to get around this little problem that I just that I just said is um, is. Um, you know, after they've responded to, well, well, how did that Ferrari make you feel? Uh, you know, you can listen carefully and you say, oh, oh, you know, that's that's really cool. Anything else? You know, just a simple anything else. And a lot of times, the anything else. So the value is? Is, is yeah. That's, that's, that's the truer answer because they kind of relieved the stress. Now we're in a more conversational mode and now you might get a, an answer that's truer to, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult for it's difficult for people to necessarily identify their feelings anyway. So a question about how do you feel can be kind of difficult. For something like feelings, you kind of have to list a bunch of feelings and let them say whether they had them or not, you know, because a lot of times, you know, feelings, what's a feeling, <laughs> you know? Now, now we, we at Panasonic have obviously looked a lot at passenger engagement. You know, we provide internet services you know, in-flight entertainment, in-flight systems, uh, services, et cetera. Have, have you looked at how engaged a passenger is in comparison to what that, how they feel in the airplane versus if they have very little to engage them? Yeah, so that's a really, really good question. And I have actually not done that direct uh, research myself. However, my sense is a couple of things. First of all, the whole construct of engagement is really, really important because in, it's through engagement is one of the ways that people don't think about the fact that they're on a hard seat in a cramped space. Because if they can be engaged in, you know, some movie that they really like, well, they're not in their airplane seat. They're, you know, with Indiana Jones, okay? That's a big, that's a, that's a way better. That's engagement. Uh, and to correlate, um, yeah, I, I haven't done that kind of research because um, we would need to determine the best uh, measures of engagement is one of the things that you'd have to do. You know, and there's, you know, there's different methods like, you know, they can check, you know, how your, where your eyes are resting and where they move to and, you know, maybe how still the person is, you know, or, or things, things like that. But that, that would be one of the first things you'd need to do is 
do a literature search to find out what research has been done on engagement, see what kind of the best studies have been, see what might be the best ways to measure engagement, and then and then run your, let's say you've built a, a really good questionnaire that you can use time and time again that would allow you to gauge what we call the happiness factor, and then you could correlate the two, do research to correlate the two. Yeah, I, I think one of the things we've also hypothesized ourselves is that it, it's nice when you go on an aircraft and, you know, the seat back's there, it's set up, it creates some of that majesty, that theater, versus when you're coming on board and, and you have to log on to your own device. There feels like there should be something there. Maybe that's another hypothesis we can test. That's a very, te- that's a great testable hypothesis. Yeah. And, and a hypothesis is basically a guess. And uh, so you'd have to think about what's the kernel of a theory that leads to that hypothesis. I mean, we could play that game right now. That's a really good point, Andy. What What is it that that, that c- encourages you to think that maybe someone would like sitting down and discovering a screen they can use as opposed to having to use their own device? What What, what, what is it that makes you think that one might be preferred over another? I think there's two factors when I think about this. One is... The ergonomics, just the situation, it's nicer, it's more comfortable rather than honching, looking or trying to, you know, hook the phone or the tablet into the the, the literature pocket, etc. And two, I quite like having that surprise content, the movies you haven't seen, the applications you haven't touched, the games you haven't played, to be there. It goes back to that magic of flight scenario is you go on board, I've not seen the new Indiana Jones, I'd love to see it. It's on the aeroplane. That's great. It, it kind of adds to the travel experience for I'm going somewhere. If it's business or vacation, it doesn't matter. It creates that that that, that fun factor. Okay, that you see, seen. so we've started the research. You've articulated very well what I call the kernel of a theory, which says that good ergonomics plus surprise will equal a better passenger experience. <laughs> okay? So then you create your hypotheses and begin to build on that theory. It's great. It's the way you do it. Well, Blake, I know the impact you've had on me. Uh, I I can tell you that people probably don't recognize the impact you've had on them if they're flown on an 87, a 737 MAX, a 777. That experience, that theater, that magic of flight largely has been down to that initial research that you and your team have done. So I want to thank you on behalf of everyone. And uh, Thank the public on listening to another great episode of Beyond Entertainment with Blake. Blake, thank you so much. Thank for you coming. very much. That was really fun. I really enjoyed it, thank Andy. You. All right. 